Hey everybody, today we're in the guest room slash library taking a look at this immaculate Fender Twin Reverb amplifier that I have here. And it is uh, too big to simply throw up on the bench. And um, what I'm gonna do ultimately is remove it from the, from the chassis and then I'll be able to get it up on the bench. Uh, the problem with this amp is you turn it on and it will blow fuses, right? So we're gonna have to dig in and find out what's going on. Let's get started. Again, I generally don't work in the guest room, so this is just gonna be about removing the amplifier from the case, and then we'll continue on how we usually work on amplifiers in these videos. <laughs> There we go, the chassis is emptied, we can move back to the workbench. Dear God, taking a quick look under here, this is bone stock original, never touched. Look at this all original Mallory and the molded blue capacitors and everything. Nobody has been in here. Look, this is as rare as hen's teeth. My God, let's take a look at the capacitors up top. I wanna see if they're original too, which, which would definitely lend itself to the problem with this amp, but wow. Let's open up Death Trap Central, have a look here. Oh dear, look at that. So let's talk about what we got here. I can, I can see that um, we've lost a capacitor. Okay, these are, I see two Mallory stamped capacitors right here. Yeah, these are crusty. Jesus. Those are Mallory stamped capacitors, and these are uh, General Electric. Okay? Uh, I can't tell you if the General Electrics are original. I know the Mallory's are. This one is gone. I can see rust bubbling out of this capacitor here. It may very well be shorter. We're going to have a great video. Uh, taking a look at these caps, I'll tell you that. Uh, the bottom ones, I'm gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna try and save, obviously, the coupling capacitors, but as far as the capacitors for the cathode bias, I'm going to replace those. Uh, aside from that, however, um, yeah. Wow, let's dig in. The new parts have arrived. I'm going to start with the five electrolytic capacitors and remove them now. <laughs> Capacitors are all in place. This section is now done. Uh, of course, I would like to test out the old ones and see how they were looking now that they're removed from the unit. So this first capacitor is coming in at a respectable 24 and a half microfarads. That's pretty good. Second one is coming in at 23 and a half. The third one comes in at just about 22. This first 70 came in just shy of 90. I saved the best for last, the uh, leaking capacitor actually shows the capacitance came in at 95 microfarads. So that concludes the uh, testing of the capacitor's capacitance. I wonder how they're gonna do on leak down though. I'm gonna go through this portion very quickly with the results. Each capacitor will be given five minutes on the highest voltage that it takes to get the eye to open and that'll be the failure voltage or it'll pass. We'll see what happens, we'll get started. I'm sure I could let this go further and get this number down even more where it would be considered just terrible um, or I could replace the capacitor which obviously I did uh, this was just to show that that it can be reformed to a degree though I would never do that and it would never stop one from exploding violently like this but yeah reformation can be done to an extent on these and that's as far as I'm gonna go uh, with uh, checking these capacitors for for leakage because it is excessive on turn up and th through using one of these machines very carefully and regulating the amount of voltage it can be rebuilt i do however really want to see this particular one so i'm going to put this one on the machine and i'm, I'm going to put the it11 away i'm not going to play with this all day um, 
Here we go. So not only was this thing leaking electrically, it was it was leaking literally, right? So we're gonna we're gonna try. This was good up to uh, 350 volts. We're just gonna start it off at three volts. And at three volts, we are we're dead short. We are seeing showing 20. I mean, it's showing 22, 18 microamps. It's not a lot of of current. But it is a dead short. So I could imagine that with the eye fully closed at, at just 3 volts. And mind you, if there's current flowing at 3 volts, if I put a voltmeter up here, we'd be looking at like 1 volt, right? And this is supposed to see the rectified voltage in and around, I would, I would guess like 300 something volts. This would be like a short to ground going through here. And it would just explode, which would be why it would probably blow in fuses, right? So I, I'll bring it up to 6. I, mean, I can see it reforming to an extent, but yeah, this is garbage. So, yeah, that's what that's that's this capacitor. <laughs> Quite terrible. Good measure, really quick. This is the other filter cap. This is not leaking ooze out of it, but I just want to see. And this one also looks like it is. It's not looking good at three volts either, though it looks like it's faring better. It may it may open. Yeah, it may open to three volts, but you're not so good. It's like trying. So yeah, both of them were bad. The other one was worse, but this would this would have been a, a disaster in the amplifier when you apply voltage. It's a good thing the fuse broke, is all I'm saying. I'll be swapping out these 25 microfarad capacitors. These are duals right here, and this is a single one, and that's what we're gonna start with now. <laughs> Gonna swap out this 50 microfarad capacitor here with a 100 microfarad capacitor to double the voltage rating. So we're gonna do that one now. Now has a brand new 100 microfarad capacitor. All of the electrolytic capacitors in this amplifier have now been replaced. That portion of the project is now complete. We now move to the next portion of this project. We're not done with capacitors yet. Capacitors play an important role with uh, how good or how poorly an amplifier is gonna perform. Uh, the couple of capacitors are no exception. I've spoken with the owner of this amp. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, remove uh, these couple of caps from one side from circuit and hook it up to the IT11. And I'm going to see if uh, they're leaky. And if they are, I am going to replace them. If they're not, I'm going to leave them alone. So we're going to let the test set decide what's going on. I'll start this off by taking capacitance measurements. I'll use a, a, my cheap LCR meter because I can't hardly bring this amplifier over to my Genrad. This is good for 0.1. This is good for 0.1. This is okay for 0.1. This is good for 047. This is good for 0.1. This is good for 047. This is good for 047. Finally, this is good for 0.1. This test is going to be a lot less subjective than the electrolytic capacitors. The charge rate is very quick because they have a very tiny capacitance. Uh, also, we're going to be setting this for paper mica. It gives it an almost pass fail. And we're going to go right, we're going to dial up all the way to the rated voltage on these, uh, depending on the cap. I believe we're going to start off with 400 volts. And if it doesn't make it, it's no good. If it does make it, it's good. And that's all there is to it. So I'll just uh, connect my connectors up first and foremost. And this is what I'm going to do with every capacitor. So it's connected. The tester is ready. I set it to leakage. Right? And I'm going to work my way all the way up to 400 on paper mica. We're going to watch the eye blip each time and should that should be it. So here we go. That capacitor is good. And I'm going to go and do all the capacitors just like that. And hopefully they'll all be good. I won't have to replace any of them. I've gone through all of the blue molded capacitors. Each and every one of them has passed flawlessly. I will replace none of them. I will solder them back into the board and continue on with the next step. 
The next thing I got into was capturing the values for all of the resistors in this unit. And it is not my favorite job in uh, amplifier repair and restoration, admittedly, but necessary indeed. I just want to point out some observations post-test, and that is, you know, uh, resistors are hit and miss in amplifiers. This amplifier is in, in immaculate condition. Capacitors were perfect, uh, um, save the uh, electrolytics obviously came as no surprise, right? Resistors, not so wonderful. And these were all silver bands shown in here. And, and just to give an idea, and we got like the, the 470s that are tied to the 6L6s. And, and they're all reading, I got these all 470s reading like 512, 512, 510. But I'm, I'm seeing here the other resistor is the, uh, uh, the 1500. And I'm seeing 2700 on here. Three of them measuring 2700. This one's out here at 4200. Just, just straight out of nowhere. That's unbelievable. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, resistors out here and I've, I've circled them in yellow. I realize it's, it's hard to see on camera. And I haven't been through circling all of them yet that are, that are outside of the 10% specification, but some of them here call for 5%. This 182 combination, this 220 by 220 combination calls for 5% and, and, and they're definitely not 5%. So there's gonna be some resistor swap outs required for this amp uh, to get it into specification if so desired. So I, I just wanted to point that out as well because that is an important part of doing all this is taking a look at these resistors or else, you know, you do the capacitors. You say, yeah, I just needed a recap. You go and you fire this stuff up and then you spend God knows how long trying to solve for all the millions of gremlins. I, I will say that another thing I, I do like to do as I as I home this in is is use the voltage charts to try and see, uh, uh, tweak these resistor values as well. Uh, the voltages used today are not the voltages used back then, which does change things. It does complicate matters a bit. Now it's time to solder all of the blue capacitors back into the board. There, now all the capacitors are back in place. I want to come off the tripod for a moment for a cool observation. Look at these potentiometers. And I'm working my way down here, right? And watch this. You ready? Look at that. This one, this one has got like whiskers all over it. Like little metal whiskers. And... Obviously, being the same exact pot, it's not because of the material itself. And I wonder, is it because of the wire in close proximity that caused it? Because no, there's no components around it, right? We could see that there's no components that could have caused that. But I wonder if it's from this wire gouged onto it and, and caused that, or if it's the wire from under here, uh, a, a voltage that caused the field around that. I'm not really sure, but wow. I mean, look at this. Here we have a close-up of the potentiometer as compared to the one next to it. I just thought that was pretty cool. I wanted to share that. We can see all these, these little fibers growing off of it. I want to point out something on these tube sockets on the finals. And I find this uh, a little less than ideal. If we see, these are the um, one watt resistors right here that are, are running across these pins. And right under it is the 1.5K ohm resistors. Now these are reading a little high, but like I said, they're not entirely accurate and they're not too far off and I could probably replace them and I probably will. And I'm going to explain why. They're laying right on top of the other resistors. And while these kind of have a bend the way they're soldered in, the bottom ones are extremely taut, right? And that could cause problems too as they heat up, not only from this resistor laying directly on top of it, but from the entire tube socket itself also throws a tremendous amount of heat from the 6v6s. So what I would like to do is remove these anyway, if in fact I can find some good rated ones that are of better quality, that are, are um, a, a good value, right, a matching value, and put them in here on the outside so they're not radiating heat directly on top of that resistor and then replace the resistor in there because they're entirely off. But when I do replace the resistor in the middle, the 1.5K, I'm gonna buckle it, right? So it's not stretched out 
under tension, soldered, so that when it heats up, it won't further increase tension on itself in the internal components of that resistor. What the after look like the uh, 1.5 is um, we can see it has sort of like an S configuration it's not straight across so it's not held taut and the new replacement 470 ohm resistor is on the outside of the tube socket away from the other resistor so that it doesn't heat everything up around it and that's what I went with so here's the new and here's what the old looks like Interesting note, these were off by as much as 80%. Uh, limiter here was 10. This one at the end was off by 180%. So that was substantial. I'm moving up here. Uh, these resistors here are supposed to be within uh, 5%. Uh, this one is 13, 7.2, 9, and 15. I'm just going to swap out all four of those and be done with it. I have a couple of other outliers here that could use a replacing like this one at, at 24%. For the uh, cathode bias circuits here that have resistors needing replacement, I'm not going to replace them yet because those resistors are going to be adjusted based on the uh, cathode bias and not simply by the resistor value. So they will be left in place for now. I don't think there's anything less exciting than resistor swaps. I, so I generally don't record these on video. I just kind of come back and say everything's done. So yeah, this is me swapping out resistors. With these four replaced, I could finally flip the amp back over and take a look at the resistors on the top side. And this is another example of resistors I'm not going to run off and replace just yet until I see what the voltages are, because the line voltages have changed. So we're going to test the tubes starting with the 6L6s. I got the first one on deck. Let me set my line adjust. Here we go. And that one is good. And this one is good. And this one is good. And this one is good. Here's 7025. And this one tests good. Here's a second 7025, and this one tests good. Here's a 1287, no gas or short lights, and this one tests good. Here's a third 7025, and it tests good. This Mullard uh, 12AX7, yeah, I don't know about it. it. It looks, it passes, but I mean, it had a flash that looked like a, like a strobe light on startup. It's not long for this world, but we'll use it for now. This 12AT7 is off the charts, looks just fine. That concludes tube testing. This is going to begin the smoke test of the amplifier. I'm going to be checking DC here at the caps up top. I've got it on the Variac, on the isolation transformer, and on the watt meter. All three at the same time. Pretty good. So what I'm going to be doing is slowly dialing up the AC voltage and uh, turning on the amp, right? So... I'm going to take it off of standby. The amp is on. I have a fuse in and there is zero volts AC and I'm going to just slowly bring this up. And there is no uh, tube rectifier in this model. It should be evident, right? So it immediately uh, will provide a DC once the threshold is crossed. This is a problem that I saw on uh, turn up and this is cause for concern. So I have staged this uh, just so we can see what I'm working with here. Uh, this is pin 3 on one of the 6L6 outputs here, and we could see uh, 486 volts. That is the voltage of the rectifier. You can see the standby switch right here. <laughs> okay, and if you're wondering, right, aside from the fact that this voltage should be significantly lower anyway, right, if the standby switch is broken, it is not. Mechanically, I've already tested the switch. We've got a short, right? And this is dangerous and it's not healthy, right? I've taken 
uh, all sorts of safety precautions here uh, staging this example and that's absolutely fine I just wanted to demonstrate this before I start the troubleshooting regiment here's the same exact scenario this is pin 4 of the 6L6 here's standby switch no effect whatsoever I'm going back to basics here and doing some comprehensive testing of the DC coming in and being filtered, making sure all these cables are correct and measuring the resistance between the positive and ground. And I should expect around 440 and I am seeing that. So that looks okay. And that comes from those two resistors right there. So I'm going to move on to the next. So this is how it works here. Here's the cable coming from the rectifier and under the board, it touches this red wire here and that goes out to those uh, filter caps that I was just testing it goes out and essentially comes right back and it's filtered right and there's a yellow wire here this top yellow wire that I touch and that wire makes its way back and it goes to the standby switch okay and that standby switch completes a circuit which allows that uh, uh, DC to flow into these two black, you see these black wires here? This is that coil TR2, right? So it's able to flow into that coil as well as provide um, the voltage for that uh, red wire to TR3, the center tap, right? And it goes in, it comes back out. And once it comes back out, you see here it comes to this yellow and it makes its way to the rest of the system, right? So what should happen is, is that when it's in standby, it should cut that connection, therefore, there should be no power going to this coil, right? And that's where I'm gonna isolate my efforts. We can see that the cable has been removed from the hot side of the standby switch. I will I'll put the probe to it. Right, there's uh, 480. Uh, this is the switched side of the power, so I'll flip it on. We can see 480, right? Right? Uh, it's getting right past the standby switch. There, there's nothing. There's nothing. So what is doing this? This is crazy. So I'm going to have to go back further. The, the short is before the standby switch. And we kind of knew that the short was before the standby switch. It, it just had to be done uh, just for the record. It takes about two minutes for this uh, amplifier to become non-lethal after I shut it off. This is something you have to constantly keep in mind when you work on these after you shut off power to go do your next step or you're dead, right? So I, I monitor the voltage of the capacitors every time I shut it down. Right now we're looking at half a volt, right? So I could do anything I want. So I'm going to continue on. What I would like to do very quickly is the next troubleshooting step, just, just really easy because it, it, it's hardly any effort. It just remove the filtration right here and see if it follows that because that would lead me to the other side of this amplifier and I'd be working on one side. It's so easy to do. I'm just going to do it now. And that's it. That, that's all I did. I've raised this red wire. Uh, none of the rectified DC goes out to that filter. I still have this removed. I'm going to repeat my test and I'm going to see now that there's no filtration up top, if there's still a short, if it clears up, I'm going to start following these wires back up and see what's going on. And I, I have found that that did not alleviate the problem. Uh, the short is definitely uh, not up top there. And that's good news too. So I'm going to focus my efforts back down here. I reintroduced that connection to the capacitor just to be absolutely sure and rule out the rectifier itself. I have pulled the main power from the rectifier. That's this red cable here to the amp. It's only a, a trace of voltage that I see on the board. The, the power is gone from the rest of the amplifier. So there's no shorts, any strangeness coming from here to be concerned about. Now, as I continue to test, I'm just gonna hook up uh, my DC power supply to here at this point. And there's no reason to have the amp plugged in anymore until I isolate the problem. So here's that power supply that was shipped to me from Pavono, the 305H. I figure I would use it for its inaugural run in this video. And basically all I'm doing with it is I'm supplying uh, a DC voltage. I could go a little higher, right? Um, basically what I'm supplying is a non-lethal uh, current limited DC voltage 
uh, that I could use to, basically as a signal trace to uh, find out what's going on without having to worry about um, any any danger, essentially. I could stick my hands in this amp and, and do whatever. And, and that's what I'm going to be using until I isolate the problem. I have lifted the return of the TR2, right? Uh, comes in after the circuit is completed, goes through TR2, comes out, and it goes back to the capacitors on the top side, right? I've lifted that, and we're looking at the test voltage. I got the standby switch, now watch. And it is off, and it is back on. We're slowly finding our smoking gun. We're doing so safely. You know, I could stick my hands in this amplifier. It is not connected to the mains power. So that is why uh, this is an ideal way of, of working through these with a uh, DC power supply when you have the ability to do so. Very quick test. Uh, just puts that cable back in here and disconnects this cable. If you're wondering why I'm going through this trouble, uh, the way these boards are set up, it, it is possible that you could have a short under there. You could have some foreign matter under these mats, right? And I'm not saying that, that there is, but the possibility exists because it's not like a circuit board where you can see both sides. I could tear out everything and rip it up and have a look, or I could simply replace this wire and remove this wire and see if the problem follows, right? And the problem is following the wire going up to the top board. Now, I previously tested the board up top before, but only for the 80 microfarad capacitors and not those 20s, right? And they branch off to a multitude of places. So so the problem could be uh, in, in all sorts of locations, but it's moving in the right direction. Yeah, sure enough, the circuit for the red and the yellow here, the uh, filter from the rectifier and the yellow wire coming back from the 20 microfarad capacitors were shorted. And I have the 17 volts on the power supply. We're looking at uh, pin three or pin four from the, uh, from the tube socket 6L6. And I'll flip the switch. And we can see there it is right now. So, so that mystery is solved. And obviously the bleed off is going to be rather slow when I disconnect having, having nothing in to drive it. It'll, it'll do a, a, a slow drop. We can see it dropping now. But uh, I think that's the gremlin right there. Finally found. So I am going to wire this back in now and cautiously uh, dial this back up uh, on mains voltage and see what we can do with this. We'll resume where we had originally left off before we found this problem.